Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Columbia Arab Alumni Association's panel on art and representation amid crisis. My name is Mediam Hassan, and I am the co-founder of the Columbia Arab Alumni Association. The Columbia Arab Alumni Association is a network dedicated to connecting alumni from across Columbia University who identify as Arab. Our mission is to strengthen professional relationships between Arab alumni and build lasting support and alumni engagement in the experiences of current and future Arab students on campus by sponsoring a variety of professional, social, academic, and cultural programs in New York and around the world. The CAAA aspires to unite alumni and bring Columbia, Columbia to the Arab world for the benefit of the university and our respective communities. We are really excited about today's panel. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our four astounding panelists. Rola Khayat is a Lebanese interdisciplinary artist and curator. Her work explores new dimensions on the representation of war, memory, and identity. Rola has curated shows in Beirut, Thessaloniki, Havana, and New York, such as the Bay Route for the third Thessaloniki Biennial, Lattice Work at the Black and White Gallery, Simmer at Kunstrom LLC, and Light in Wartime at Apex Art. Her work has been exhibited at the Macedonian Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, Catalyst Arts Belfast Photo Festival 2013, the 21st International Istanbul Art Fair, and History of North Hi and North of History. Uh, Khayat received her BA in Historical Sciences from the American University of Beirut, a diploma in Intensive Drawing from the Florence Academy of Art, and an MFA in Visual Arts from Columbia University. She is currently a fellow at the Magnum Foundation and an assistant professor in the Painting and Printmaking Department at VCUQ, Virginia Commonwealth University of Arts in Qatar. Selim Marwood uh, has worked in the field of human rights in conflict-torn countries for more than 25 years, living between the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. He now shares parts of his journey through his artistic work that comprises sketches, paintings, graffiti, comic books, and many written articles exploring the reasons behind violence, human misery, and social injustice. Born in Sydney, Australia in 1973, he holds a master's degree in interior architecture from the Lebanese Academy of Fine Arts. Besma Hamdi is a research-based de uh, research designer author and educator producing work that bridges historical, political, and social issues with archival, documentarian, participatory, and critical mechanisms. She is co-author of the book Walls of Freedom, Street Art of the Egyptian Rev Revolution, published in 2014, as well as co-author of Khat, Egyptian's Calligraphic Landscape, published in 2018. She has been interviewed and featured extensively in prominent international media, such as the New York Times, The National, TRT World, Fast Company, Huck, Der Spiegel and print and exhibited and spoke at several art and design festivals and conferences around the world. In 2016, Hamdi was recognized for excellence in research in the Communication Design Educators Awards by Design Incubation. In 2018, she received the Distinguished Achievement in Research Award from VCU Arts Qatar. Hamdi earned an MFA from MICA in 20, uh, 2003, a post back certificate from the School of Art Institute of Chicago in 2000, and a BA from the American University in Cairo. She is currently a candidate at PhD Arts, Leiden University, and the Royal Academy of Art. The Netherlands and Associate Professor of Graphic Design at Virginia Commonwealth University. And last but not least, El Cid uses Arabic calligraphy and a distinctive style to spread messages of peace, unity, and to underline the commonalities of human existence. His artwork can be found all over the world and consistently aim at unifying communities and redressing stereotypes. Born in 1981 in Paris to Tunisian parents, he was disconnected from his Arabic roots, speaking only the Tunisian dialect of the language at home. In his teenage years, in a kind of quest for his identity, he began to delve into his own heritage and learn to read and write standard Arabic. It was during this journey that he began to develop his artistic style of calligraphy, which would later bring him worldwide acclaim. His work has been shown in exhibitions and in public places all over the world, including most notably on the facade of l'Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, in the Favelas de, of Rio de Janeiro, on the DMZ in between North and South Korea, in the slums of Cape Town, and in the heart of Cairo's garbage collectors neighborhood. In 2017, he won the UNESCO Sharjah Prize for Arab Culture, he was named a global thinker in 2016 by foreign policy for his project Perception in Cairo. And in 2013, he collaborated with Louis Vuitton on their famous Follard d'Artiste. So without further ado, I'm gonna step away and I'm going to leave it to our remarkable panelists. Thank you all for joining and we hope you enjoy.
Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you for this generous introduction. And hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Rola Hayat, and um, I'm super happy to welcome you all to this incredible all-star panel event. Um, thank you to the Columbia Arab Alumni Association for inviting me to moderate this talk. It's really um, a privilege to be here and to be amongst you all. Um, as you already know, the panel event today is titled Art and Representation Amid Crisis, and it's um, organized by this incredible alumni association. Um, with us today, uh, we're very lucky to have three incredible artists and activists who are going to engage in conversation about the different ways that art is integral to the ways that we experience protests, both in the present and in the past 10 years. So we'll be thinking through different ways that we can live, be, and make art amid social and political crises. Um, we'll be addressing questions like, how is art created in concurrence with, in reaction to, and in participation with times of political and social upheaval? Um, what is the significance of street art in reclaiming space and power during political upheaval? So before we begin our discussion, I want to thank the Columbia Arab Association for organizing a panel that allows us this sort of platform and to think about larger questions around the question of art and representation in times of crisis. It's a very relevant topic and uh, it plagues us all. Um, so in the interest of getting started here, um, I'm just gonna give a, a quick overview of how this event's gonna run. So for the first 30 minutes or so, I'm gonna be posing a few thoughts and questions to our panelists, after which we'll move on to the Q&A with the audience. So in this period, please um, drop your questions or comments in the chat and we'll uh, be sure to address them uh, later. Um, so without any further ado, um, I want to thank our speakers for being here along with all of you. And um, yeah, let's get this conversation started. So the first thing that, that really comes to mind for me and um, that I'm really interested in is the, is the role that art plays, both as an instigator or a sort of reactor to political crises. Um, and this is, goes out to all the panelists. Please feel free to pop in and go first in, in your response to the question. Um, so, you know, looking back at the, the Arab uprisings of 2011 and um, just thinking about what we've learned in terms of the ways that art was produced, experienced, um, archived, and, you know, later censored or whitewashed in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and if you think um, in particular of what happened in Egypt, um, if you think of how art became this weapon of the revolution, how it, it rallied the people, it you know, countered mainstream, mainstream media censorship, internet blackouts, um, all forms of opposition against you know, free speech. And it in a way challenged people to, um, to ask questions and to challenge the status quo. So, I mean, in short, the streets became, uh, you know, this interactive sort of dynamic um, newspaper for the people, uh, for the people and of the people. Um, it became, um, street art became an agent of change. It also was a form of knowledge and evidence of, of death and violations, um, which were being censored or muted or, or just not accessible to the public. In a way, it was an alternative to this uh, state-controlled propaganda or the fueled, like propaganda-fueled media. And Basma, in your book, uh, Walls of Freedom, um, Street Art of the Egyptian Revolution, um, you trace the whole revolutionary journey uh, through the street art, you know, from the early like days of the euphoria, the, the hope um, and uh, this inspiration that, that, that the, the, the uprising started off down to its like slow decline over you know, a, a period of three years. 
Fast forward 10 years, um, now we're in a season of new uprisings, um, which is a very interesting moment um, because we're, we're seeing, you know, the resurgence of street art and we're seeing the resurgence of this whole like uh, calligraphy, um, calligraphy art. So the cycle continues. Now, coming to my question is, I think it's worth revisiting the role that uh, art plays um, as both a reactive medium during popular uprisings and a proactive agent um, in and of itself. So my question is, what do you make of this tension? And uh, more generally, how do you articulate the role of um, you know, creative output during times of political and social upheaval um, and just the overall impact of, of art in, in times of crisis? And so I can go first. Um, I think that your analysis or, you know, I guess the general discourse on this is that uh, street art is traditionally viewed as uh, a reactive medium that isn't necessarily um, perhaps um, sustained in terms of its effect. So it has this reactive, it, it, you know, the artist creates the work uh, passers-by see it, it could be whitewashed, it could be not preserved, and then it sort of expires in terms of its effect. Um, I guess in Egypt the situation was a little bit unique because we, beyond just the traditional component of street art, and we can get into the dynamics of what street art is or graffiti because the terms have been used interchangeably, um, I think uh, traditionally street art, yes, perhaps was something reactive that, um, you know, is either seen or you're, you're exposed to it, but then maybe the reaction ends once the piece is gone. But in Egypt, we had a social media revolution. So everything, so the, I think the, the reactive component or the sustained reaction um, was carried through through social media. So an artist would create a piece, someone would take a photo of it, it would be shared on social media, and people would come and visit the piece, and it would just continue to be, or even the artist would be creating the piece, people are shooting and taking videos and posting, and then people are coming while the artist is making the piece. So it was like the cycle of continuous reaction, production, and revisiting, and then uh, dissemination, uh, if, you, if you wanna call it that. So I think um, in, in Egypt, because of the, the power of social media and the power of documentation and photography and dissemination, the, I think the street art um, uh, reached a lot, of, a lot more people than it normally would. And it wasn't just happening in Egypt, but it would reach people across the world. So everyone was following along with what was happening. And like you're saying, it, it really does, did become a reflection of all the events. Um, every single thing that happened was basically documented on the walls. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but you can feel free to no, ask a follow-up or, yeah. No, it does, it does. Uh, I'm curious if uh, Salim or MC would have any thoughts on this. <clears throat> you know, uh, yeah, I would like to add, for example, uh, you know, me, I'm originally from Tunisia, but I, I was not in Tunisia during the, uh, the uprising of 2000, 2011. And uh, the funny thing is like a lot of people, you know, they associated me with this, you know, saying that uh, I read some, some article in French newspaper that I saved my people with my graffiti, which uh, it's totally absurd because I was not even uh, in Tunisia at this time. But um, me, what I noticed actually uh, during the uprising in Tunisia is the fact that, um, you know, usually people say that artists create revolution, but uh, I think the revolution in Tunisia allowed, uh, allowed more artists to, uh, to be born, I would say, you know, having the fact that, uh, you know, not having this kind of uh, fear of, uh, of expressing yourself uh, publicly had uh, had like I think inspired people to say like let me be creative and let me okay speak out on the world you know so I think uh, I felt like in Tunisia like it's the revolution who created the uh, the artist and uh, and it's important also to say that you know uh, um, 
you know, you talk about reaction, like creating as a reaction towards something, you know, and uh, I, I believe that, you know, no matter the way you do it, you know, um, the fact of painting or creating any artistic piece in the street uh, is, uh, is by sense a political act, you know, and that's how I see it, no matter where it could be, if it's like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, like a critique to the government or just, I don't know, uh, a love letter, you know, to anybody. I think for me, just the fact of giving this to the public is a, is a, is a political act. So that's how I look at it in, as an artist me today. Um, Salim, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, this um, actually, it, it's, it's a perfect sort of uh, entry into the next question. Um, I'm just, I mean, I'm curious about how public, um, public art, if we, or if we're going to call it street, uh, street art um, activates a public space or an urban space. Um, we saw, you know, in the Egyptian revolution in 2011, how, um, this, it, it, it kind of popularized this, like, uh, you know, displayed on the walls in, in, in you know, Tahrir Square, uh, was all using the, the Arabic script and, um, and it became this kind of publicly consumable art. Um, and it, it created a, like a transformation of the public space uh, and the urban space and the dynamics of the people. And it activated, you know, conversations that wouldn't have happened if the art wasn't on the walls and wasn't publicly accessible. And we're seeing it today in, you know, in places like downtown Beirut, where there's a, an ongoing, you know, uprising. Um, maybe the the Arabic script, you know, conveys a different message. It's all, it's maybe anti-sectarian. And we have slogans like, you know, our weapon is our words, revolution is a woman, Thora has no religion. So it's very sort of localized to like the, what's happening in Lebanon. But I'm curious, I mean, how this act of painting on walls and making, you know, public, public, you know, uh, or political uh, work on, 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 on in public spaces um, sort of re territorializes the city and subverts like the state control. It's a way of like reclaiming public space and, um, and so my question is like, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, and Sid, you mentioned this, that like making work in public spaces is a political message in itself, right? So how does your work, when it's, it's set in this public, how does it uh, change the dynamics of the space? Um, and um, yeah, and from your experience of making work in public spaces, like what are the conversations that have happened and what are the dynamics that you've witnessed changing as a result? I think you, you, you create a, a kind of vector for discussion, you know, uh, because you're in the public space, uh, you know, you, you attract everyone, you know, no matter what are their political or religious views. And, uh, and for me, what, what I enjoy the most is, you know, when I paint, and I'm just the witness, you know, of the conversation that's happening behind me. And sometimes I wish I could record that, you know, and you see like really deep debate, you know, when people just are doing it, they just speak about what's happening on the world and this what's happening on the world question, like move to a total different subject. And and uh, and I saw, I think, you know, I saw many times people who, who uh, I'm talking about Tunisia at this point, many people who like wouldn't be able, wouldn't, find i think uh, like a place to meet uh, and exchange uh, their id i think they find their place you know uh, in front of uh, in front of, of a piece that i was creating not saying that's that's my piece that create this but um art i think uh, as a you know attract your i think i think arts touch our humanity and bring emotion you know and that's uh so like, no matter what you think or what are your political view, you art will create an emotion. So you're attracted by this and you find your way in the, in your, you find yourself in the same place as somebody else. And then a conversation starts. And I think that's the power of 
of art in the public space is like really to it managed to bring people together in a certain way and yeah that's that's a personal experience yeah i completely agree and i think uh not only does it bring people together and allows them to have a conversation and debate and engage in discussion so there are there's a, a, a particular location in Cairo in Muhammad Mahmoud Square, where it's a, it's a street adjacent to Tahrir Square, where artists would paint the AUC, the American University in Cairo building. It's an old uh, building that's no longer occupied by um, the students. The students have moved somewhere else, but that wall is, is huge. And the artists would paint and repaint over that wall in reaction to various events that were happening. And a really uh, key moment uh, was um, something called the Poor Saeed massacre in 2012, where football fans were basically massacred. They were in a, watching a football stadium in Poor Saeed, and many of them passed away. And so Ammar Abu Bakr um, and Ala Awad, they created a massive mural that commemorated the martyr, martyrs, and they painted 72 um, portraits. Ala Awad painted a an ancient Egyptian scene from the tomb of Ramos. It's a mourning scene. So it was like fusing history um, and the mourning that is traditionally part of uh, ancient Egypt with this contemporary event that happened. The interesting thing then that what were the people who would stop by and, and talk to the artists as they were working. Um, then a, a man came by and would create these wreaths and, and would write uh, beautiful kind of words uh, made out of uh, plants and, and twigs and stuff like that on the floor. And the space started to become this space of commemoration and remembrance to the point where the friends of the martyrs would come and visit their friends' portraits. And there's a few images and walls of freedom of, of friends, um, you know, carrying, let's say, the Ahli flag, which is the uh, Egyptian football team, and crying near the, the, the friends' portraits. And mothers would come and cry near the, the, their sons' portraits. But over time, this would be, it would morph and change. And so uh, when the elections were happening, uh, Ammar noticed that people were no longer interested in that Poor Said event anymore, and it started to become forgotten. And uh, he started to paint, instead of painting the, uh, he painted over the martyrs' faces and he painted their mothers crying. And he wrote a saying that said, uh, So it was like an ironic, so it, it means forget about the past and just worry about the elections. So forget about all these people who died and just think about the elections. And things would, kept getting painted over and the people would come and stop by and have conversations and discuss and talk about the elections and talk about why this event shouldn't be forgotten. So it was a really, I think, that specific wall is, is very significant in terms of becoming a very politicized and very activated space. The artists would continue to paint through as they were getting gassed by the authorities. So they were actually wearing gas, gas masks as they were painting. So. There, there are numerous stories about these, uh, the walls, and I could go on forever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that wall is a testament to the revolution, and now it's uh, it's completely whitewashed, isn't it? Is it? Um... Yeah. All right. It's yeah. Whitewashed. Yeah. yeah. And this is what I was saying about the documentation is very important. So I'm very grateful that I was able, we were able to document uh, all of that for for future generations. Mm -mm. And um, yeah, that I mean, that brings me to another question about like archiving, um, you know, art that's produced in times of political turmoil or uprisings, which are, I, they come out of a, this like impetus or this desire to, to react to a situation. And, but then the timeline isn't guaranteed and you don't know what's gonna happen in the end, right? So, um, I mean, you, you were wise and you documented this, the whole evolution of the art that was being produced during the Egyptian revolution. And so we, uh, I mean, now as, as Lebanon is experiencing a series of, you know, uprisings, we kind of anticipate that maybe the end game is going to be this kind of whitewashing of all the art that, that's appearing on the walls and it's slowly happening now. Um, and this also, this brings me to another question. Um, 
to what extent do you think your work, um, you know, is meaningful across the span of time uh, and beyond this like immediate moment of creation? Um, for you, Basma, I mean, as an archivist and also a researcher, um, and then for El Cid wow. and, and um, Salim about, you know, creating work in times of political uh, crisis. Uh, Rula, I, I tried to uh, comment twice, but once my uh, my microphone was muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm I'm a bit perplexed with the question of art and politics in the uh, Arab world because it's very cultural specific. Also, you know what we witnessed from uh, the Arab Spring until now is um, a reaction to an event. Uh, the case of Egypt, because I was there personally also during the event. And I've been, you know, in uh, most countries of the Arab Spring because of my work as an activist. Uh, what happened was very uh, temporary, you know, it happened because Egypt, for example, you know, I mean, people were really looking forward to have an open space and the space was open. Tunisia was the same. Beirut is such a complex situation because it has all the complexity of the world and the oxymoron, you know, like, I mean, we always had freedom of expression, you know, uh, and, but we never had, you know, a massive artwork on the street. So my conclusion is that, you know, uh, the revolution or the upheaval, they often do a favor to artists more than the other way around, because it becomes a platform for artists to show themselves, you know, and to start, you know, showing also their, uh, their ideas, but their political ideology, unfortunately, you know, we did not see much of political ideology from artists. You know, like in Lebanon, for example, it was enough to, to write Saura, love, whatever, but there was no ideology, you know, uh, that drove the artist. It was more, uh, me, me included, I was on the street, you know, I had an ideology because I was fighting for a civil secular state, Dauli Madania, and it was always, you know, around this subject. But also, you know, time like this, you know, uh, especially uh, in the Arab world, where the culture is different from Europe and other countries, uh, it was a performance for, for the artist. You know, we had audience for the first time on a larger scale. So people passed by, interacted a little bit, and then they left, and then they forgot. Uh, I always give the example, you know, uh, I was in Brussels once, living there in Belgium, before the uh, revolution in Beirut. And they had, you know, the uh, explosion of the airport. And at the same time, you know, we had the Bataclan in France and Charlie Hebdo. So there was lots of, you know, terrorism, you know, at that time happening. And somebody, you know, printed out poster, you know, asking, would you sleep with an Arab? And then they put the small posters, you know, half A4 everywhere in, uh, in, in Saint-Gilles in uh, Brussels. So I took a stencil, you know, small stencil. It was the first time I do something on the street. And then I started, you know, stenciling on every poster. You don't know what you're missing until I got to the pub where I want to have a drink. And then obviously we started talking and the people who put the poster were having a drink and then we engaged in a huge debate. And the debate was going on. Here in the Arab world, unfortunately, we're not at the point where, you know, we have a debate about art when the event is over. You know, I mean, once the spectacle, I call the revolution always a spectacle. When the spectacle is over, nothing is happening. I mean, you look now at Beirut, you look, you know, in the Arab world, not much is happening. Like the widespread of uh, art, you know, uh, around the world is, is normal because, you know, people outside, you know, where the event is happening, they like to look at art more than looking at people being, you know, smashed by the police or, you know, brutality or whatever. So it's mm. a different medium. But we need to start thinking, like, I mean, when we do something on the street, how can we make this culture more sustainable? How can we start commenting on, as Basma was saying, like, you know, but big events like the Ahli team, you know, it was a big event, you know, a big massacre, you know, but little social issues, you know, and socio-political issues that we're facing on daily basis, they're not yet represented, you know, uh, through street art, you know, uh, and this is something that we need to be debating further. Uh, Salim, uh, to add to that, I mean, your art is like your central character is the bull, right? Yeah. And you use it in a way to, um, to represent maybe the people and the politicians and you do it as a way to provoke right and you've gotten i from what i've read and what i've seen uh you've gotten some reactions which have spurred you to make uh new works of art with the with the theme of the bull 
So you're reacting to like current events and your art is very much like recycling whatever happens in the space and the conversations that you have, and then you would kind of transport that onto the wall and make art of it. Is that an accurate? Uh, yeah, you know, yes, mainly, but uh, I've, I've been involved before art because I'm an activist before becoming a, an artist and I'm still confused whether I like people to call me artist or activist, you know? Mm. But for me, you know, uh, Working on secular state, you know, Dauli Madani, especially in the case of Lebanon, you know, where it's a big issue. It's been a long process, you know. Uh, when I started working, you know, I, actually I started painting for four years before the revolution. Nobody was interested in my work, you know, here in Lebanon. People outside Lebanon were interested. And I, I used the Minotaur, the Minotaurus, half man, half bull, uh, as a representation. When I put it on the street, uh, and this is an important point because, you know, the artists do something, the population, you know, digest it in a different way. Mm -hmm. So if there is no debate around it, then, you know, maybe the message of the artist is lost. So when they saw the bull, you know, they were so happy. They said, wow, you brilliantly managed to depict the politician as animals. And I was like, it's not only the politician, it's the politician and it's us because we voted for this political elite and we are also responsible. And I was trying to talk about this dichotomy between the, between the good and the evil in the person, you know, in, in one person. And how if we really want to have a revolution, you know, we need to have a revolution against the animalistic aspect in our side towards our society. But uh, people, you know, like they, they, they didn't like it, you know, they didn't like, you know, to be compared to a bull. Some of them, they used to see it like a goat or like a dog or whatever. Uh, but what helped people to understand better what I'm doing is the slogan that came with my work. Mm. You know, uh, my work usually had slogans, political slogans, you know. Uh, so uh, I, I guess it's an interesting space, you know, and, I, and you mentioned something, uh, Rula, you know, the, which is quite problematic for me, reclaiming the public space, you know, uh, or reappropriation of the public space, you know. I mean, this is a very complex issue also. Because uh, if we put, you know, like a painting, you know, uh, on a wall, does it mean we're reclaiming the space? And what is reclaiming a public space? There is another issue also that we need to be aware of, that, you know, most artists also moved from, you know, a, an impulsive action of doing something on a wall to being subcontracted by big companies today to have a representation on huge building in the city. Are we still in street art or this is more of like, uh, it's a different dynamic. You know, and if you notice around Beirut, which is a phenomenon, most of the uh, buildings which are painted, the huge buildings, uh, you would wonder also about, you know, what is the political message behind it? And, and maybe it doesn't have to be the case, you know, like, I mean, people can, can paint their painting the way they want. But you have these artists who are like painting these huge paintings, and at the same time, they are, you know, considered as, you know, revolutionary street art artists, you know, and I, I think, you know, here also there is another space for a huge debate, you know. Uh, what are we putting on our buildings, you know, this is a message in the face of everybody. This becomes mm -hmm. you know, the image of the city also, you know. Uh, so, I mean, in Lebanon, it's still a bit mm -hmm. too early to speak about what happened, you know, uh, because, I mean, everything has been documented, of course, you know, with social media, uh, but I scanned them, you know, and I, I looked so much. For me, again, it was more a space for the artists to show their work. It's like, you know, it became the CV of the artist uh, mm -hmm. rather than the other way around. The challenge is, are we going to keep this, this culture or this, you know, uh, way of expressing or not? Obviously, now, since the revolution, you know, went down and there's no more people on the street, we don't see, I mean, like we didn't see, for example, you know, everywhere in the Arab world also, we did not see much artwork, you know, street art on Corona, you know, uh, which mm. is a universal pandemic. You know, when I painted my building here outside during the confinement, uh, the neighbors thought that I was losing my mind, you know, but we didn't see public work, mm. you know, like engaged public work, because for me, it's politics also, you know, Corona is politics, like to express it, to talk about it. Yeah. We didn't see, you know, uh, and it's universal issue, but it's I not only, Tunisia related or, you know, Egypt or Lebanon related, you know, uh, oh, sure. I was expecting to see you know, more about it uh, from, from street, engaged street artists, yeah. unfortunately not. 
in a way it's being overshadowed by the you know political economic in the region so it's just one of the many problems that are plaguing um the region i'm just curious if uh, Basman and Steed have any reactions to what uh, Salim was saying i mean i i i'm i'm not sure like i'm i'm not really sure how we can lump commercial street art with with political street art like there's a huge distinction between an artist getting commissioned to make a work um, or deciding or like you were saying earlier reacting to a particular uh, political event I don't necessarily see uh, the all the work from the Egyptian revolution as a performance or a spectacle uh, we could argue that anything is a spectacle like we could argue that me, you know, let's say uh, creating a speech in the middle of, a, of an arena or, a, you know, a city is a form of a spectacle or a performance, but that doesn't diminish from its power, I think. Um, I ha have particular incidents where the there was reclamation of public space. And if you look at a city like Egypt, where people were completely helpless in the political scene, they had no say, they, there was a lot of repression and censorship uh, by the authorities, by the media, uh, even art was kind of sponsored by the government. There were only certain channels where people could exhibit their work and, it, and even the youth salons and things like that were mostly um, managed and um, I would say coordinated by our ex uh, arts minister who was, uh, you know, one of Mubarak's, uh, you know, cronies. So th there was um, uh, an opening, I would say. There was a, a small crack where people were able to express themselves and they did. And there are many incidents where, for example, there's a very famous piece called Tank versus Viper by Genzir. Um, and this piece was painted in the middle of the night uh, and it was under a, a bridge in, in Zamelik. This piece was painted over by uh, pro-government or pro-military um, street artists. Mm -hmm. So they transformed, so that the, initially the piece was a tank versus a biker and the biker was a bread boy and it was supposed to represent the military attacking the people. And so they painted, um, they painted out the bread boy and painted people that are patriotic with flags. And then so the next day, another artist came along and painted a big monster in the shape of the military that was eating the tank. And then, and this debate kept happening on the walls and it kept being documented and people would visit that space and comment um, about how there was this tension between, uh, you know, the, the military and the people. And the whitewashing of Muhammad Mahmoud is another example where the walls would get whitewashed. And then the next day, the artists would actually go and paint in Sahkamen, you know, uh, we don't care. We're going to keep we're going to keep painting. And so, yeah, I think I think there is a reclamation of public space. I think people occupied Tahrir Square. They occupied Muhammad Mahmoud. There were there was tension. There were there were tanks that were released into the streets, but definitely there was I think a reversal of this oppression um, for for a window of time. I'm not saying it was sustained, but it's definitely something that people still remember fondly and mm -hmm. uh, look forward to one day having something like this again. And if you look at Egypt, the history of Egypt is we have a revolution every hundred years. And uh, there's always art that accompanies that revolution. And that revolution, uh, the, the art that comes out of those particular revolutions is well documented, well taught. And so I think this is in referring, in referring your, to your question about archiving and the importance of documenting and archiving. So, uh, you know, then what's, what's the point of having someone who's a curator or an archivist or a documentarian to collect that work and, and put it in a publication um, if it's just a fleeting moment. So we have a lot of curators in Egypt who are doing phenomenal work. If you just look at one particular example, like Muhammad al-Shahid, who's documenting modern buildings and talking about collecting them all in a volume and then commenting on that, that's inc incredibly valuable. And if you walk the streets of Egypt and you see these buildings, mm. 
this is just an analogy to street art. And if you see these buildings separate, you will never see them in that light. You will never understand them. They're all little pieces, but put together in a volume and then uh, analyzed and understood in terms of uh, the, the, the roles of uh, both colonization and um, identity and heritage and the effects of a Western, let's say, occupation on the architects that build these buildings, you see them in a completely new light. So I think we can't really think of street art as small isolated incidents of spectacle and performance. And you really have to look at it and evaluate it as a whole. That's my, my view. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree, uh, no, but, yeah. but please, you know, to clarify one thing, you know, I mean, when I said, you know, performance and spectacle, and I insist on the uh, terminology, it's not to downgrade the work, you know, I mean, performance and, mm -hmm. and spectacle. And, you know, you have many sociologists who wrote about it, you know, uh, what is the performance, you know, and society of spectacles, you know, there is a huge essay by a French uh, uh, scientist about it, you know, uh, explaining how, you know, the representation itself, if we're, if we're watching a piece of theater, it's representing mm -hmm. something that just happened, you know, we cannot, you know, represent something which is happening. So in a way, you know, the way the Arab Spring or Arab Revolution, and this is, you know, now more of a political analysis, and they were kind of a spectacle happening in that time and then, you know, later on vanishing, you know. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, the artists, yes, they were performing, we were performing, we had audience and this is nothing wrong about it on the street. But Basma, what I was referring to about, you know, mm -hmm. the difference between the private and the uh, art during the uh, time of upheaval, and Egypt, I don't know, because I was away from the art scene at that time, I was more with the activist. Uh, but in Lebanon here, you know, there was a huge fight on the street between street artists uh, that, you know, they didn't want anybody to touch their walls. You know, a colleague of mine went to put a stencil on a wall and then the organization, because here in Lebanon, I don't know if you know, uh, most of the walls that were painted in Beirut during the revolution, they were funded, funded by organizations, non-governmental organization, you know, uh, supporting the artists and everything. And there is a group of artists, they work together and once they're not on the street doing, you know, street art during the revolution, they are subcontracted to do buildings and hotels and everything. And this, this is also, you know, and, and as I said, you know, we need to study it more and we need to see uh, how can we push street art, even if there is not a revolution uh, happening, you know, like if there is no revolution and people are not in Tahrir Square or mm -hmm. in downtown, mm -hmm. there is still a need to express ourselves and mm -hmm. use this medium to push it forward. On the documentation, I cannot agree with you more, Basma. It's very important because what happens if it's whitewashed later on, it's very well to document it and it's the memory of a city, the memory of a population and everything, you know? And uh, I always said, you know, in one of my pieces, you know, on uh, the wall of Teatro in Beirut, I invited people to come and vandalize the art, you know? And I said, street art must be vandalized uh, as the politician must be vandalized by the people on the street, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. Strangely enough, people were afraid to do it in the beginning. They were afraid to touch, you know, a painting and to vandalize it. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not used to it, you know. Whereas if we look at the street art, for example, you know, in uh, England, I mean, the, the huge famous fight between Robo and Banksy, it was amazing. And, you know, one used to paint something, the second one used to come and, you know, paint over it and everything. So that, that was a debate. That mm -hmm. was, you know, uh, an amazing debate between I love the, the reasons for it, that's a different story. Yeah. Hmm. I think the reason why I was reacting yeah. to that was because you, n not that I, I know the society of the spectacle, but I, I was referring to you saying that the art, the, the, the art, the art, the artists are gaining more from the revolution, not the other way around. And so this is why it sort of makes it seem like it's, um, yeah, that, that it's something about the artist's ego. And I agree, a lot of artists have egos and they want to prove themselves and there were fights on the walls and all of that. But for, for the most part, I think the, at least for Egypt, the art of, of the Egyptian revolution brought attention to what was happening. It wasn't just the, the, the amazing, of course, performances in Tahrir and the crowds and all of that, but it was also the photographers who were taking the pictures and it was also the artists who were creating these massive murals. And so the, I remember all the articles and the journalism and the, the press that was happening. 
And instead of it seeming like a violent revolution, because that's what the government and the military was trying to portray, it looked like a peaceful revolution because you couldn't see all this art and say, oh, these people are, are savages or they're, you know, they're crazy or et cetera. Mm. Um, yeah, it's very interesting when like street art is no longer something stationary and it's something that moves towards us rather than us to, having to visit it in the actual space. Um, but I just want to ask uh, El Cid, I mean, El Cid, um, uh, you use a lot of um, not like blatantly political, uh, um, you know, uh, script in your, in your uh, calligraphy um, arts. Uh, but you use like you reference proverbs and uh, and poetry and it's all in Arabic and it's uh, using the uh, calligraphic script. But your 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 locations, the spaces that you activate, are very sort of strategic decisions. You really choose like for instance, I I, I would be curious to hear you speak about um, the 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 work that you did in in Manchiet in Manchiet Nasser in the Zabalin um, um, area of uh, of Cairo, if you could just talk to us a bit about um, your experience doing that that work. Uh, just I would love to to follow up on the on the point that Salim uh, mentioned. You know, like if we are uh, as artists, if we just act in a time of uh, crisis or in the time of revolution. Uh, me, as I mentioned, you know, I was not in Tunisia. I was living in Montreal at the time of the of the Tunisian revolution, and uh, and for me, it was also. Um, I received so many people like telling me that I was there during the revolution. So I, I didn't create anything uh, in Tunisia for over a year, you know? So actually I went back to Tunisia one year after the revolution to uh, the first piece that I created was a year after. And, um, and you know, I, I painted actually in a city called Qairwan, you know, uh, like in the center of Tunisia. And it was a, it was a cultural center, like, a, a big world actually it was one of the first biggest world that I do, and um, I was interesting on this wall is that the, the director of the of the center was telling us like during the revolution actually people every single day they use this white 40 meter wall as a as a canvas actually to express themselves at this time and you know like and every day this wall was painted over you know and so the next day was a, a new canvas for those people to come and. Uh, and me having this actually like going back there was uh, I you know like this notion of taking you know reappropriating you know taking back you know like the public space I felt it because I what I was painting I remember there's a, a, a kid that now is it's not a kid anymore like actually he's part of my team he documented my work he asked me what I was doing and I said I'm painting he said can I help you I said yeah it's just you know like I'm finishing tracing and then you just fill up the color and then he stayed with me for like the first day and then the, during the same day he, he called his brother two girls they came and at the end of the day I had like six people who um, were helping me and they stayed with me like for 10 days and I asked them I said guys you know like uh, you're spending all day with me like working you know like we in not getting paid for that and and they said you know we just want to uh, we just want to say like you know like to own this part you know like to say like in 10 years like, yes, you see this part of the wall, I did it in my city, you know, I own this part of time and this part of land in a certain way. And uh, and that's, I don't know, that, uh, that opened my mind a lot, actually, in, a, in, a, in the purpose of, you know, of street art, you know, art in the public space. And then the other project that I did, you know, and then we speak about perception, it was uh, a year after we did the minaret in Gabes and then the Lost Walls. And the Lost Walls was going in a total different direction of what, people were expecting from, I would say, a street artist at this time, you know, I mean, 2013, I didn't want to talk about the revolution, you know, I was like, Tunisia has like such a deep history, such a deep uh, culture, and I just wanted to highlight it, you know, by painting walls all around Tunisia, and we did a project called Lost Walls, and I think that bringing a bit of depth, you know, and, um, and yeah, so me, uh, as an artist, I tried not to, uh, honestly, I tried to not follow uh, I would say the news, you know, and trying to react to uh, what's happening, like, you know, like the news of today, and then I'm going to create a, uh, a piece, you know, like, for example, you know, like any subject that can come to the news, I wouldn't react to it straight away, I would wait a bit. And for example, the project uh, I did in Manchet Nasser in, 
in the Cairo Garbage Collector neighborhood was uh, uh, I wanted to speak about perception and I I couldn't find better or more more like appropriate community than the Garbage Collector of Cairo to speak about perception because those people have developed the most powerful recycling system of the world but because they're associated with trash they're totally marginalized and uh, and it was honestly was the most uh, amazing human experience that I've done you know and uh, and just to combat on the subject you know of you know street artists who, who sometimes do commercial art you know uh, you know me, me I do commission project Manchetna so it was a a self-funded project, so I didn't have any sponsor on it. You know, I, I co-produced with a friend of mine a movie about it, but all the money that went there was money from my pocket. And sometimes I think as an artist, there is no shame to go and, yeah, you can be commissioned to paint a mural, you know, if this can help you to do something else on the other side, like, I don't even see any problem, but there is a certain limit, you know, I wouldn't go do a project for like some brands that I don't share the same value with, you know what I mean? But uh, I think there is a there's a balance that you know you, you need to find, and then I think it's totally personal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just gonna open it up to the the audience now. I'm just I'm mindful of time. Uh, we have a question from Roshana Nabi. If the point of activist street art is to send a public message that will have an intended impact, do street artists consider the methods of other disciplines such as advertising and marketing when they are creating? which follows up with what you were just saying. Look, uh, let's, let, let's clarify one thing. There is nothing wrong by, you know, being commissioned to do something, you know. No, no, but, I know, I know, Salim, it was, uh, I'm just... No, no, I, did, I, I agree with you, but what I'm trying to, to raise here, the point is, did street art become, you know, part of our culture, you know, socio-political culture, you know, or is it, you know, only, you know, accidental or... It's uh -huh. temporary and impulsive, you know. Uh, uh, for me, because more, maybe because I'm more an activist than a uh, an artist, you know. I'm, you know, I'm, a, and plus I'm a self-taught person when it comes to art. Uh, maybe I'd like to see more impulsive, reactionary uh, art. It doesn't have to be huge murals all the time, you know. I mean, you, you give me huge walls, I'd love to paint them, you know. I mean, people don't ask me to do it, but anyway. They're scared of the bull. But, uh, you know, like commenting on current affairs, you know, socio-political, socio-cultural, socio-economic in a continuous way, uh, if we really want to utilize art as a vehicle of social change, you know, that's the subject of our discussion, uh, we could still do a lot more, you know, rather than, you know, just waiting for the big event yeah. Have, like you know an uprising and everything and i guess right. our responsibility is to keep that you know uh going you know yeah. ongoing uh thing and I think, you know, sorry i i think you know uh, street art was democratized and bring to the face of the people in the Arab world during the uprising 10 years ago but if you check uh you know i can always have this debate you know with the uh, with a graffiti writer from from the states or Europe, you know, when they say like, oh, graffiti came from the from New York. There's a type of graffiti that comes from New York, from those kids, you know, like in the Bronx, painting on train because they wanted their name to be seen, like in up uh, uptown Manhattan. But if you if you check at the same time in the 70s, late 60s, you have people in Palestine, you know, painting mm -hmm. spray paint on walls. And they didn't call it graffiti, you know, like uh, they were writing crazy messages, you know, like they, they used to train kids, for example, to uh, to work with spray can. And as soon as they saw that they were like ready to paint, they used to send them in the street and with sometimes like a political message, sometimes like, a, you know, like a message uh, for the martyrs. And sometimes you have like big murals just as a as a proposal for a wedding, you know, and and but nobody talk about graffiti seen from this side of the world this side of the world but that's part of that's part of the you know of the culture and i just think it's um you know like uh, the eye light there was a big light on the arab world and the street art and some people think i started painting in 2011 you know that you know that make me smile you know because before that people there was no attention nobody would care like oh yeah and and i follow you you know like i don't think we should be commenting you know like uh like the 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 news on a daily basis and i i think we should work on a on deeper subject and 
And, yeah. and I think you, you learn that with time, you know, like 10 years ago, I would, as soon as something happened, I would speak about it maybe. But I think today, like uh, maybe with age, I, I think it's important to get something deeper and, uh, and create a social change in a certain way. Um, well, I also think I just want to comment on that because I, I think I think it's really unfair to compare countries in the Arab world with Europe. Uh, so I also want to say that, it, let's say, in reaction to the U.S. elections, you have all of a sudden people are debating, they're creating memes, there's like a huge influx of, of images and art created in response to the to, to let's say the whole election and Trump and all of that and that happens and then it ends and we move on so mm -hmm. any any major event that happens in a country triggers an artistic response so, uh, yes it was intensive but there was street art in Egypt before the revolution um, and I just think that it's what happened after the revolution and when the military took over uh, a lot of artists actually were afraid for their lives. People had to flee. There's examples, let's say, Ganzir had to flee. Um, there were uh, artists that stopped painting politically because they were afraid of the consequences, because people were being thrown in jail. And so I, if I was a street artist during the revolution, I certainly wouldn't be painting now. And maybe there's a way to kind of modify the message and change it slightly. But I think people are, they're also just, um, tired, you know, they went through this intensive period of trying to resist. And now it's like, like Elsie was saying, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's important to create commissioned work just to be able to sustain yourself. Yeah. And also you can put like a, uh, you that's mean, fine. There's, a, there's a question in the chat box by Omar side. What are some of the challenges you face with the Western audience viewing your work? Me, for me, the Western audience viewing my work? Is that the question? Sorry, where is yeah, that? The Omar side is asking. Uh, Omar. But this goes out to everyone, all the um, panelists. Reward? Is, is it? Oh, oh, that's Sounds Diana. Sad. Sorry. Okay, the first one. What are some challenges you face? Uh, well, I think my, it's, it wouldn't be my work, but it yeah, probably work would, would be the work that I document. And I, I think, uh, mm -hmm. I think the, the response was quite positive to, to the book at least, but, um, in terms, I guess, in terms of street art in particular, um, there were a lot of, I guess, Western, maybe journalists or Western authors who wrote about street art of the revolution and wrote about, uh, the art that was produced. And um, I think it's important. I, I mean, it, it's, it's hard. It, sometimes it's hard because they don't really understand the context in which the work was created. So unless they're working closely with someone who's part of that, either who created the work or is, uh, understands the underlying events that were happening, it's kind of hard to do the work justice. So I guess that would be my take on a Western misunderstanding or viewing the work but overwhelmingly i think the response to the book and to the street art was really positive from a western perspective mm -hmm. um and seed and salim do you have any um I, I, it's a funny incident you know like um, th there is a french person who did a blog about you know beirut graffitis and street art during the revolution and she took the liberty to explain them, to explain them the way she wa she wanted, you know. And I found it exactly, you know, more interesting than what I meant, you know, because she had all of my work, you know, on one page with comments on them, you know, what I meant by it. And then I was like reading that, I was like, you know, this is mind opening, you know, this one I didn't mean it like that, that one I didn't mean it like that. But it was nice, you know, to see how other people look at it, you know, and the interpretation of it within the context, the political context, you know. Because artists, you know, they know their society, they know, you know, uh, and uh, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting always, you know, to see how people interpret it, you know, uh, if they come, not even from the West, you know, even on a local level, people see, you know, a piece, you know, in a different way, and it means to them something totally different, yeah. 
Uh, we have a lot of questions that you can answer live. Uh, we're going a bit over time. So maybe we have uh, time for just one last final question. And then if you have the time to respond to um, everyone asking questions, that would be great. So Diana is asking, as an artist, what's the most rewarding reaction you've gotten to your art that made you feel you had gotten your message across and contributed something really amazing to the world? Uh, I will respond to this. Uh, you know, like uh, before I went to, to Cairo, first time I visited Cairo 2015, um, I was going to this place uh, that, you, that everybody used to call Hay Zabalin, you know, and which is like, uh, like the neighborhood of the garbage people. And so um, I spent, uh, yes, it took me like five months to convince the priest to let me do the project. And then when, uh, when I did it, you know, I started getting closer to the community. And uh, I realized actually Zabalin was not the name. Uh, the real name was Zaraib, which means the pig's breeder. And, um, and so like, I kind of uh, militate, you know, like to make sure like people stop using this word Zabalin, the garbage people. And then there was a, an article actually in a, like one of the biggest newspaper in Cairo that used the word Zaraib, uh, you know, to mention those people. And I was like, okay, halas, I think we, this was a, uh, our my mission is done you know like I, I i managed to switch the perception in a certain way and i think that was for me the coolest thing to see that people from outside from cairo living there like naming them with the rename and not with this Zabel name maybe we can squeeze in one last question this is a question i actually even wanted to ask you uh, about the role of social media uh, Amina Sal is asking, uh, the role of social media was mentioned in regards to the street art being shared during the Egyptian revolution. How do you see the role of social media changing the way we, cre we create and consume street art? I mean, it's, I think it's huge. I think uh, the reaction to, like, I, I think it, things go viral and when things go viral, they reach more people and that draws more attention to the event. So whatever was being created in Egypt would get shared on social media. And that's actually how I like I found my my passion for uh, street art of the Egyptian revolution, because I found it on social media. Initially, I wasn't in the street when I experienced uh, the street art. I found it on Facebook and I was just so fascinated and wanted to find out more. So I think it, it helps reach more people. You're able to get access. You're able to explain the work. Um, a lot of people were documenting and keeping not just social media, but creating blogs that were, um, you know, as Salim was saying, not just Westerners, but even Egyptians keeping blogs and, and putting up photos of the work and also writing their own interpretations. Mm -hmm. And then journalists would pick that up and write an article about it. And then, you know, and it's just a cycle of, I think, um, like a domino effect. Mm -hmm. I, I might add, add to what Basma is saying, you know, like when you spend time on the street, like, I mean, during the Beirut thing, you know, Lebanon, we, we used to spend, you know, hours, like, you know, sometimes 12 hours painting and everything. And then you leave the wall and then you see the comments on social media. It gives you a different perception on what's happening around you when you are doing it, you know? And it's, it's very interesting because it shows the diversity of how the revolution was moving, you know, how people, you know, accept or refuse, comment, you know, uh, and also, you know, like the question, the most rewarding thing, you know, uh, for me, for example, is is when, when they destroy your art on the street. Uh, it, seriously, it means, you know, like the message got through. Like I remember very well, you know, in Beirut when the pro-government used to invade the squares, uh, Hezbollah, uh, I, I remember, you know, uh, they were beating me like, you know, heavily and saying, you know, we will break your hand if we see you drawing again for the revolution. You know, which means, you know, like, you know, the message, you know, came across, you know, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that every art should be vandalized, like people exhibiting in the gallery. I exhibit sometimes in the galleries. I don't want people to go and burn it. But mm -hmm. uh, again, political art and as an activist, it's good when it's consumed by, by the public and especially by the angry one. It means the message is coming across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it provokes a reaction. Um, I don't know if we have time for one more question. We're going over time, but um, how are the, how are you guys doing? Can you answer one more question? Are you, yeah, Ken? Okay, so um, 
Haya Rendur is asking, when talking about art as an indicator of a peaceful form of protest, how can we better navigate the relationship between art and necessary violence against injustice? Can it be harmful to view art as removed from or an antithesis to violence? I, I'd like to answer that, uh, Rula. Hmm. Uh, although, you know, I have to admit it's a very complicated issue, you know, violence and revolution, you know. Uh, it depends on what's happening, you know. We should not be afraid, you know. Uh, Violence is not always physical violence, you know, according, you know, to political sociology, you also have invisible violence, you know, and art could bring invisible violence or visible violence uh, a lot. It depends on the circumstances and what you're fighting for, you know, if, uh, if at some point, you know, like, I mean, we were violent in the revolution when, when, when the police used to throw on us, the tear gas bomb used to throw it back at them, you know, uh, so there is this dynamic of violence, you know. So uh, it depends on the context you are in and it depends, you know, what you want from your manifestation and, you know, why you're on the street, you know. Uh, and I guess art could accompany that also, you know, in all its phases, you know. Uh, painting on a wall is peaceful, but it can be violent also, you know. And if the circumstances, you know, uh, you know, pushes you to be in this dynamic, why not art could also be a medium, you know. So, uh, let, you know, I mean, historically speaking, you know, if we look at, you know, the uh, political art, you know, they carried lots of, you know, violent messages, you know, the communists and everything, you know, Bolshevik and everything. So it depends on the ideology of the movement. Thank you. Um, any closing thoughts? We're, we've run way over time. Um, I still have a million questions I would love to ask you, and I'm sure everyone else in the audience does too. But uh, if there are any closing comments, from Besmar and Seed, um, please go ahead. Uh, I can just, I can read that someone's asking about Walls of Freedom and uh, the book is banned and it's also out of print, unfortunately. So it was censored uh, by Egyptian authorities. You can't get it anywhere in Egypt. You can find some copies on Amazon. Some are selling for hundreds of dollars. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, we we 500, uh, 500 copies that we sent to Egypt were confiscated and the rest of our print runs sold out. So um, we don't have funding to produce more books. So if you can get your hands on one, get it now. And you have a digital? We have a digital, but we're kind of hoping that we could still republish it. But we do have it digital, yeah. Mm. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Basma and Salim and Isid for this. It was such a fantastic conversation and um, I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we have closing remarks from uh, Rahma wants to say a few words, but uh, I hope we meet soon and continue this conversation. Pleasure. All right, thank you so much to our incredible panelists, El Seed, Basma Hamdi, Salim Mawad and our amazing moderator, uh, Rula Khayyat, who joined us today from Dubai, Qatar, and Lebanon. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, my name is Rahma Stisi, the other co-founder of the CAAA with Maryam Hassan, who started us off today. I'd like to thank you all so much for such a vibrant debate and discussion on the power of art and representation in times of crisis, especially in the context of Egypt, Lebanon, and Tunisia. I personally loved hearing all of you speak about the transformation of public, spe uh, public space via street art, especially in the Tahrir Square in Egypt, and was really interested when we were talking about how street art can be interpreted as an act of reclaiming the city, state subversion, and even as comm commemoration of martyrs. So I know I've learned a lot this past hour, and I'm sure all of our attendees also valued hearing your unique perspectives and your respective areas of expertise. So again, thank you so, so much. I also want to thank the other board members of the Columbia Arab Alumni Association, Omar Abboud, Khadija Abdin Nabi, Diana Mujahid, Nadine Mansour, and Ghada Jirfal, who are all instrumental in making today's panel happen. And of course, thanks to all of our 70 plus audience members who joined us today. If you know anyone that was interested in joining but didn't have the time, we'll be, this panel was recorded and we'll be uploading it uh, in the upcoming week. Um, and we really hope to see you all at future events. Uh, hosted by the CAA. To stay connected to us, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook and join our listserv. 
I'm going to be dropping our website link in the chat for everyone to see. So you can see all of our future events here and join the listserv to receive emails. So thanks again for joining us in today's webinar, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Salamat. Bye, everyone.